Hello and welcome to uh, season two of my new podcast called Friends in 3D. My name is Katya and it is my great pleasure to, uh, uh, to introduce my friend for the first episode of our podcast of, of the season two. Her name is Janina. Uh, she uh, she is a wonderful photographer, a stereo photographer, also an artist, and I'm very excited to have you here. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the invitation. I've been looking forward to this actually. In in every conversation, I usually ask my guests to talk a little bit about yourself. You know, whatever you are comfortable of to to share with us. Okay. Well, I I was thinking about how to introduce myself, and I sort of thought my Instagram bio kind of covers it because it says artist, photographer with a lot of dogs, and that covers a large chunk of my life. I guess that's the shortest way to introduce myself, but I have a degree in linguistics, so languages are also a big part of my life. I really enjoy just figuring out foreign languages, and you know, even if I don't know them, I still love to try to figure out what people are saying, that sort of thing. I write quite a bit, but mostly for myself, and obviously I draw and I take a lot of photos, very many photos of all sorts of things like the dogs in my life or other animals and a lot of nature and recently also the concerts so basically whatever catches my eye and if I do have my camera which I usually do I take mm -hmm. pictures of it. My lifestyle just sort of consists of traveling a lot and moving a lot. I like seeing new things, new experiences, meeting new people. I don't know that sort of, I hope that covers it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's actually interesting that you know I'm uh, not not from linguistics, but from a, a mm -hmm. very uh, close field. I am a literary scholar, uh, but my husband is actually a, a linguist, so, so so I kind of know a little bit about this uh, yeah. this uh, this field of, um, of it's, science of scholarship. Yeah, <laughs> it's really interesting. Like for me, it wasn't. Like at some point it gets too theoretical. So you just sort of come up with theories and if you come up with proof to prove them, then that's great. But it wasn't really hands-on enough for me and I didn't really, I enjoy creating and you can't really do that in linguistics. So that's why I decided to go into a different direction with a bit of design and in that area. I see, I see, and that's interesting. And you are from Germany, I, I assume. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I've lived in Germany for the first 15 years of my life, and then I went abroad for a year to Denmark, where I lived with a Danish family and went to a Danish school, and that's where I learned Danish, and um, then I moved back to Finnish school in Germany, and then I sort of, I lived in London, I lived in Scotland, I lived in Denmark again, I went back to Scotland, <laughs> then I went to Austria, and then Germany, and then Austria again, now in Germany for a bit. A lot of travels. Yes. <laughs> a lot of travels. I also traveled a lot so, in my life. So it's, uh, again, something I can understand that, and, and yeah. the excitement of it. Like you, you both have an, an excitement, but also sometimes it's, it's, it's hard because you have to sometimes readjust to, yeah. Yeah, to every, every new country or in, like, every new city. My dream for the near future is to just live in one place for two years without moving. <laughs> like, I hope I can achieve that. <laughs> I achieved it also only in my like late thirties. <laughs> so, okay, oh dear. But before that, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's just life keeps happening. Like I don't necessarily always choose to move, but it just sort of happens, and I don't mind. But eventually, I just get tired of moving all my things. That's the main problem, I guess. <laughs> like if I didn't have so many things, which just accumulate over time, yeah. it would be much easier if I could just pack my suitcase and go. But all the books and my record player and my stereo and my bass guitar and just it's a lot and it's quite big and it's heavy and I see I see so uh, I wanted to ask you about photography first like photography in general because uh, I can see that you uh, you know I love your photography and the, both Thank your you. co your concert photography because there was uh, recently we, we are, we, uh, as we, we speak there's still a Rhapsody tour uh, of Queen and Adam Lambert going on, so so we're all still excited about this. So I really love your concert photography, and I was actually curious how you managed to to do it so well because I I think you are not allowed to bring in the professional cameras to to the show, and all, but also your nature photography and of course your dogs. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, uh, I, I assume that the uh, stereo photography is more recent, but how about the photography in general? Was it always your home? how did you get into this and what what does it give you so how does it in inspire you um so I don't remember the date exactly but I got a first my first camera as a present for some 
sort of religious holiday. I'm not very religious, it's just sort of something you do here, so I don't remember when that was, but I'm guessing it was around 10. I got like a small mm -hmm. digital camera, so that was 2006, around that time. I don't know, as a kid, you don't really think about what you take photos of, you just sort of take photos of things, but I always enjoyed that, and um, my mom always said they're great. I mean, that's maybe just something moms say, but she liked them. Then the phones got cameras and it got more accessible for everyone. And I never really stopped taking photos because I think it's just part of a life mm -hmm. these days. Um, but I bought my, my first camera that I bought was a bridge camera um, in 2016. That was getting back into photography. Before that, it was more like, oh, it's something I used to do as a kid. It's something I do with my phone. But I made the decision to buy the camera because I wanted to do it more. And I wanted to, I don't know, try to see what I could do, I guess. I upgraded that, that very quickly. I've bought three cameras myself and it's just, a, just sort of something, I don't know, I, I keep doing it, I can't really stop. There are times where I just don't have the energy or when I look outside and I think, no. <laughs> but sometimes there are months where I always bring my camera. So it's just something that's always been part of my life in some form, more or less intensely. But for the concerts, I actually, it's a gray area, I suppose, that I'm living in <laughs> because I'm, I'm not allowed to bring my big, um, my Sony, my big camera, uh, because it has interchangeable lenses. So those are usually the ones that aren't allowed. So I have a Panasonic, a small mm -hmm. Panasonic. I, I didn't bring it, but mm -hmm. it's, it's quite small, like 10 mm -hmm. centimeters. It is. I'm actually surprised myself how good the photos turned out. Like I knew they would be good because obviously the show is great and it's mm -hmm. hard mm -hmm. not to get excited about photos of the show, but the quality did surprise me as well. So I'm very mm -hmm. impressed. And I just, yeah, professional cameras aren't allowed and compact cameras are sort of, like mm -hmm. I said, gray zone because phones are allowed and some mm -hmm. phones take really good photos. So in Zurich, um, it actually was permitted to bring compact cameras. And in Cologne and Munich, I wrapped it in a scarf. Yeah. It was just, <laughs> no one asked. So it didn't, it wasn't a problem. Usually it's the interchangeable lenses that mm -hmm, get mm -hmm. pulled out, which is fair because, you know, mm -hmm. you have professional or paid photographers yeah, that bring yeah. good equipment and mm -hmm. uh, they wouldn't really have a point in being there if everybody brought their good cameras. But uh, yeah, again, I was I was I was really impressed because I think that the hardest. Well, I'm, I'm not, of course, I'm not a professional photographer, but it's my understanding that the light is always the the hardest thing. And at the concert, the lights are um, are so bright that uh, not yeah. all like my my phone really cannot handle it. It's just you know like everything is very blurry. So so I was really impressed. Like it's so you know crisp and um, I don't know. It looks very cool. On your, on your photos so so yeah really so great. yeah <laughs> with phones it usually is like the camera um it has sort of light measuring spots and um with a phone it's usually it measures the entire screen and takes the average of that so if one part is very dark and one part is very bright like the bright part will mm -hmm. usually end up too bright in the picture with my camera i can tell it to just measure measure in the center so obviously the musicians in the center will have the light on them so if it measures the center the light will fit the center when I researched the compact cameras, I really paid attention to that it could do well in a concert setting. That was my priority. Oh, so I see. I see. Yeah. yeah. So was... I did buy it with the intention to eventually <laughs> go to a concert with it. Mm -hmm. And then COVID came, so mm -hmm. didn't get used at a concert for a very long time. But yeah. now it has, and I am impressed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's good that it's... you got to use it <laughs> yes. after all these years. Yeah. So uh, while we're still talking about photography, so can I ask you about stereo photography and how did you come to this? How did you learn about uh, about stereos? And uh, um, again, uh, since you know you do photography quite, you know, treat it quite seriously. I was wondering how um, how similar or how different it is for you, you know, as an as an artist as well, because you you are an artist. So you know, like, uh, are there any subjects that you prefer to to do in stereo or any moods that you would rather do in monos? I think. Like most people, I found out about stereoscopy through Brian. It was, I don't know when, but 2012, 2013. I always thought it was a bit peculiar and it probably is, but I never had the chance to actually see it in stereo and I couldn't free view in the beginning. I only learned that in 2017. So in the beginning, I always thought, you know, 
there probably is a point to the pictures, but I don't get it. So when I lived in London, Brian actually exhibited part of his collection in the Tate. So obviously, as you do as a Queen fan, I went to go and see it. Mm -hmm. And I got to view the stereos in 3D for the first time. And that was sort of when I thought, you know, that's pretty cool. There is a point to doing this. And um, I tried to free view for a long time and I never managed until, like I said, 2017. And in that year, I was living in Copenhagen and there is an amusement park in Copenhagen, Tivoli that had um, very interesting Halloween decorations and the LSC had a Halloween competition going on. So I thought, you know, I might as well go there and try and send in my stereos. And I did. And they actually, I don't know if you can say won, but they were featured mm -hmm. as part of their competition. And that sort of pushed me into, you know, apparently I can sort of do this. So I might as well. Mm -hmm. I want to know what else I can do. like. Was it just a coincidence or is it something I can develop on? Yeah, it's a great encouragement. I actually, I had a very similar, so, sorry, I'm interrupting you. Yeah, that's uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I, I had a very, very similar story because I, I started, I also, well, I, I bought uh, Queen in 3D book, uh, got really interested in this and started taking my own stereos. And then, and it was like, uh, the sp I think it was spring. And then summer, which was uh, 2018, I think, the LSE, London Stereoscopic Company, announced a competition, uh, which was based actually on uh, the Poor Man's Picture Gallery mm -hmm. book. So that was the one, I guess, that was in Tate, yes, the, the, the exhibition. And I, I just uh, decided to stage it. So I, I just asked my kids and my friends, so we staged a couple of scenes uh, just for fun. And I, was, and I was absolutely sure it won't get anywhere because I was such a newbie, like I really had no idea what, what I was doing. <laughs> but one of my, uh, of, uh, of my uh, stereos got into top 12. So it was just, okay. like, it blew my mind. <laughs> so so I, I, it's really, you know, like I started, I don't know, maybe four or five months before that mm -hmm. from, from scratch really not knowing anything, not knowing every, anyone in the stereoscopic community. So I had no one to ask even, you know, about the, how, how to do it properly. <laughs> so so it, was a, it was an encouragement. I, and I guess for me, it was also like a big step as a, as a you know, stereo enthusiast. Yeah, just sort of like a, like a sticker, you know, well done. <laughs> and um, I think you asked about the comparison between... Yeah, stereos. yeah, that's a different, like what's... If, um, if, you, if you feel any, if there is any difference between these two things or are they basically this, the same for you? There is, like in a way, there's a really big difference. But on the other hand, like I try to combine them somehow. So for stereoscopy, I usually look for in interesting um, like 3D-ness. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense, but like, yes, absolutely. For me, yes. if, something just, <laughs> if something is just parallel to or perpendicular to the lens, um, then it's not very interesting in 3D. It might look beautiful in mono, but it wouldn't make sense in stereo. With mono shots, I like I'm a very visual person, so I just sort of I need the right lights and the right what do you call it? The composition, that's the word, and the right mm -hmm. colors and like things need to come together to work as a mono. What I really enjoy is when those mono scenes work out in stereo as well. So when I was in Scotland, I think maybe you saw the ones that I posted of the Scottish landscape in stereo. Mm -hmm. Like those are some that I think work really well in mono as well. You could print them and hang them on the wall, but there is also a nice 3D effect. So that's the sort of thing that I always try to look for, but it's not always possible. Like um, some scenes, like I don't have a stereo camera actually. so. Any stereos I take are sequential, um, either with one of my cameras or my phone. Mm -hmm. And that limits which scenes I can take stereos of, because if there are moving objects or people or animals, then they don't work as stereo. So I just, mm -hmm. I've learned to not even bother in those cases, which is also something, I, I guess, <laughs> that, you know, a small achievement. It's like not, not forcing anything, but just recognizing, you mm -hmm. know, that won't work. And that's okay. And focusing on taking monos instead. Yeah, I, I understand that I, I'm also a sequ sequential photographer and I, I, I don't have a camera. I think only recently I, made, I started 
thinking that maybe one day I can get one because it would be just interesting to uh, to be able to take serious of moving things, <laughs> things mm -hmm. that are moving and don't, don't stay still. But still, it's I don't know. I I'm quite happy you know, just doing it sequentially. Yeah. yeah, what what keeps me from getting a stereo camera is the fact that it's rather limiting because you can't move the lenses further apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's I enjoy the freedom yeah. mm -hmm. being able mm -hmm. to move just a bit further to get something more in the distance. And also, um, I take a lot of stereos of my dogs. I train them to freeze. So Loki, <laughs> especially the brown one, yeah. um, he knows when I have my camera and I tell him to sit and stay, then he actually like he stays he freezes and he mm -hmm. waits for me to finish and then he offers a different position and freezes and waits for me to <laughs> so he's actually really posing for the stereos and he really enjoys that mm -hmm. so i don't really see the need for a stereo camera for myself yeah. just because <laughs> i thought you had a stereo camera because of your of the the, the, the <laughs> stereos of your dogs because you know i have a cat and i can only take stereos of her when she's asleep because <laughs> it's not it's impossible or when she's like yeah. kind of sleepy and not really moving i can imagine like with a cat it's more difficult but even yeah. the black and white dog um mm -hmm. he he never really liked photos mm -hmm. because for dogs it's like the lens staring at them that makes them very uncomfortable usually yeah. you know but he's he's the oldest one so i wanted to mm -hmm. take some stereos of him mm -hmm. just for memories mm -hmm. so i actually took my time and really trained him to accept it like i took a photo and it didn't matter if it was good i just mm -hmm. gave him a treat yeah. and we're done so we started yeah. really slowly yeah. and by now he actually he enjoys it as well like mm -hmm. he's really you know look at me sitting <laughs> here i look great take a picture of me <laughs> that sort of attitude so yeah, yeah it's it's a nice bonding experience in a way as well i never really saw the necessity for a stereo camera just because yeah. i have two or three scenes a year where i thought oh this would have been nice but yeah, i like the yeah. challenge i suppose with the normal yeah, camera yeah. I wanted to ask you about uh, your art and uh, mm -hmm. and you and you also you're one of the very few people who do, also does stereo art, which is I, I don't know, like <laughs> I really can't imagine how how hard it is because I'm not it's an painful. artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's not uh, and I assume it's not a conversion, but you actually no. do it manually. Wow. Yes. Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's that's really amazing. But uh, uh, yeah, before we talk about stereo art, can I ask you when did you start drawing again? Is it somehow you know related to Queen to be and Queen Fandom, or did you draw before as well? So was it your, you know, lifetime hobby? I did draw a lot as a kid. I used to um, be a lot around horses, so I have a lot of drawings of horses from when I was younger. But then when school got more intense, I stopped just, except for like, I think all of my school notebooks have flowers and things mm -hmm. doodled on them, mm -hmm. but I never really drew the way I draw now when I was mm -hmm. in school like in in high school I suppose would mm -hmm, be the equivalent mm -hmm. and then it was around 2014 I think when I was in London um that I started drawing but actually I started drawing um I remember the first serious drawing after the long break from um childhood was Paul McCartney I actually like the one with the top hat i don't know if you remember seeing yeah it. yeah I, i've seen it yeah yeah I, mm -hmm. I redrew it again last year or the year before just to see how i improved so that was the first more serious drawing that i did mm -hmm. and then it wasn't just queen it was like all the bands i listened to yeah. i drew those and through time it just sort of developed and then i started out traditionally so with pencil and paper that was always my equipment just because mostly because it's cheap like mm -hmm. you can take any pencil any paper and you can draw yes um but then i started to get into more complex drawings and more equipment and colored pencils so i actually upgraded to a digital drawing board just because like i said in the beginning i travel a lot and i can't always take all my sketchbooks and pencils and everything with me because it takes up space and it's quite heavy as well and it just got impractical so i wanted to draw digitally but I don't like digital art is different from the traditional art because you have more possibilities with the different layers and everything so I always say I draw traditionally but in digital form so like I treat the screen as a paper and I have the digital pen as the mm -hmm. pencil so yeah, yeah I don't I don't usually do any fancy effects like the most I do is different layers just because mm -hmm. it's practical but also it's dangerous because sometimes you just draw on the wrong layer and then it's pointless anyway but yeah, I um, see. yeah basically yeah. it's like digital pen and paper for me just yeah, out of yeah. practicality 
And I remember you had this uh, wonderful series of uh, of drawings where, where you would combine a figure, you know, of a musician, for, mm -hmm. for example, with uh, some uh, famous painting. Yes. Yeah. I think I think there was uh, there were I, I remember a couple of them. So it was, yeah, it was so very um, cool. Um, Freddy with Caspar David Friedrich. I don't know what the painting is called in English. Well, I think I... it's the Wanderer or something like that. <sighs> I don't know. That was funny because I was watching the video for a kind of magic, and I thought Freddie's outfit in the video sort of is pretty much the same as in the painting. So I thought, you know, what? What if I could just combine those? It's a really fun challenge, but the thing is, my brain doesn't work on command. So mm -hmm. doing it as a series was a bit dangerous because eventually <laughs> my brain just wouldn't do it anymore. Like I. I always have to do multiple things at once um, mm -hmm. just so I can do what my brain wants to do. That was fun. It was fun. Yeah, it was fun. It was a very interesting, very interesting experiment. <laughs> yeah. How about stereo drawings? How did you do it? <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, with a bunch of tears, like the first stereo <laughs> drawing I did was of the skull guitar. Oh, yeah, I remember and that. Yeah. that yeah, it's the memories are painful. Like I remember one time I just lay down on my bed and I screamed because it was <laughs> the shading. It drove me insane. Like yeah. getting to match the shading, it doesn't match a hundred percent. But yeah. I gave up before I made it worse. <laughs> that sort of situation. It took me two weeks of drawing, like five or six hours every day, and it was it was an experience. And I don't know why I did it again. To be honest. Um, but did you use any, you know, did you look at this uh, through the stereoscope or did you just try reviewing it just to see how it works uh, So or, or using some mirrors? So For the skull guitar, yeah. um, mm -hmm. I don't remember where, but there is a stereo of the skull guitar, actually. Oh, okay, yeah, so, so you have a reference, it, yeah. It, it wasn't quite the same angle, so I had to combine... Um, two or three different stereos mm -hmm. and also a couple of monos just mm -hmm. to get to the angle that I couldn't see in the stereos. Yeah. Um, but it's sort of like I pieced it together and um, having the stereos as reference really helped. But my different, uh, my other stereo drawings, I didn't have a reference in stereo for either of them. And for the third one I did, I didn't have a mono reference either. So the third one was really just without any reference, just sort of guidance. And for those, I found for me, it works really well if I draw one side and then sort of overlay them. And mm -hmm. I do I do draw it twice, mm -hmm. but um, I finish one side first mm -hmm. just because in the guitar, I didn't. <laughs> and that, that wasn't the right way to do it. Like even, yeah. I mm -hmm. even though I had the stereo mm -hmm. reference, it was really, really hard. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's also the reason why I've only done three. Like I have one in mm -hmm. mind that I might do but I haven't fully committed yet just because yeah. it's, it's intense, especially like with Brian's hair, oh, you yeah. really have to do it mm -hmm. bit by bit and working back to front works for me. It's still, it takes a lot of time, but it's not as painful as what I did the first time. Yes. <laughs> that's, uh, that's amazing. You know, I'm really like, I'm really in awe. It's, uh, it's, it's great. It's great. I also consider doing the um, Bowie drawing that you have printed out actually yeah. in, mm -hmm. um, in stereo, but, yeah, I looked at it closely and I decided it was too much detail. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't have the nerves to do it. As... Maybe later. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, so talking about, speaking about uh, music and Queen and uh, Bowie and Brian May, well, for, for me, I can tell you about myself. I, 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 was, a, I was a Queen fan when I was a when I was very young, when I was uh, a teenager, basically. And I loved Queen all of my life, but uh, I kind of, uh, you know, this this passion kind of rek was rekindled in uh, 2017. And that's how, when I became like a super fan, yeah, as mm -hmm. you would say. So um, how about you? What uh, what was your journey with, uh, with Queen? I grew up in the 90s, uh, so it was sort of impossible not to hear the music. You know, it was just always something on the radio, but mm -hmm. I have one memory from... I guess when I was about eight, something like that, um, when We Will Rocky was on the radio and my mom showed me how they did it in the disco at, when she was younger. So like getting on the floor, just banging your hands and then clapping. And um, I remember I was really fascinated by that. But what fascinated me most was the fact that the band was called Queen and it were for men. Like that's sort of like my, my brain just I don't know. I was learning English at the time. So I knew Queen was like a female. And then there were four men calling themselves Queen. And my brain was sort of like 
didn't quite comprehend it, but I thought it was really cool. When I was in school, I I was never really like a fan of anything ever. I just sort of, I was always the oddball in the class. Like I was always the odd one out. And um, all those bands that people in my class listened to, I never really got it. Just, it was a bit weird, but um, I figured, you know, there has to be something some something about the music that I like because when people ask me what music I like I always said I don't know but obviously there are some songs that you love more than others so I kept a list of songs that I liked when they were on the radio the vast majority were Queen songs so I figured you know maybe I'm onto something here so I actually sat down on YouTube because Spotify wasn't really a thing where I lived then and just looked up Queen and all their songs and listened to them one by one and I really enjoyed them all pretty much mm -hmm. so that's sort of when that became when people asked me what music do you like I knew I could say Queen and Led Zeppelin mm -hmm. and Bowie and that yeah. sort of followed but Queen was sort of the entrance into that kind of music. I think for me, uh, when I came back to them in uh, 2017, I remember that there was this day when I kind of, you know, just wanted to, to listen to Queen. And I just, and, and also I went on YouTube on just on their official channel and started playing all of mm -hmm. their uh, videos. Some of them I could remember, some of them I had never seen before. And then that's that's how it started for me. Like you go into this rabbit hole of, <laughs> of yes. YouTube videos and you just cannot get out. You just never come back you, out. You cannot, <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. When I got into Queen like more seriously, um, I think shortly after or just about that time, they actually got together with Adam. So I remember hoping <laughs> and um i actually saw them in 2015 in london for the first time with adam yeah i was really excited about that i still remember the day when the tickets went on sale and i was supposed to go with a friend and she wasn't answering her phone <laughs> so i was sitting there like i don't care i'm buying this ticket and i'll go by myself if i have to <laughs> so you saw them pretty early that's that's great yes <laughs> I'm, that's really I'm really happy yeah. i don't remember yeah. I don't remember too much of the concert. I think I was just too excited, but I like I, I still see the view of the stage in my mind. I remember some songs and also the funniest memory or not really funny, but yeah. the sweetest memory I have was um, before 39, Brian actually explained the theory of relativity and um, he asked us to cheer for Albert Einstein. <laughs> I thought that was really sweet. Also, the selfie stick and everything, like oh yeah, he did that used to be a thing. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, and he did, I think, stereo, uh, stereo yes, in, selfie sticks as well. Yeah. I think in 2018. That was, I but, think, the, yeah. the, first, the first tour I kind of followed, that, even though I haven't attended it, but I watched yeah. a lot of videos and uh, listened to live streams, you know. And so, yeah, it's a bit so of a shame he's not doing that anymore. Like that yeah. was always a fun part of the show. <laughs> yeah. So do you think that your creativity as a photographer, as an artist, uh, somehow convey, um, conveys your perception of uh, Brian's or Queen's music, uh, or maybe other aspects of, uh, of their personalities? Yes. So what, what do you think? Is there any connection? I, well, I assume, you know, you drew the members of Queen, you drew Brian, but uh, how about the photography or maybe your other drawings? Does music affect them? Or is it st still, you know, a separate thing for you in terms for of me, your creativity? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. for me, it's actually a separate thing because like, I am i don't know how to explain it, but I don't really, I'm a visual person. So music is something else. Mm -hmm. And then the drawings are another thing. So I usually listen to music when I'm drawing, mm -hmm. but I don't draw the music that I'm listening to. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a separate thing. Um, and most drawings that I did of Queen were actually because I like the reference photos. So I would usually just go through photos like mm -hmm. when I was feeling like drawing I went on Google and I typed in Brian mm -hmm. May and whatever mm -hmm. year sort of I was having in mind and um, I looked through the photos until I found one that sort of spoke to me because of the light or the angle mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. and then I decided to draw that so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's sort of my usual thought process behind mm -hmm. the drawings it it's fun to listen to him while drawing him mm -hmm. but um, what I have done is to draw um, Brian, especially with his interests. I've drawn him with the, with the guitar, of course, yeah. um, but also I've drawn him with a stereo camera. I just recently did that, actually, mm -hmm. a rather big portrait. Mm -hmm. And um, 
the drawing he signed for me when I met him actually shows him holding a badger. So yeah, that sort of that does play a part, but it's mm -hmm. not like a motivation. Mm -hmm. And one thing that of course always works out is drawing him and making the background space related. I've done that as well. Yeah. And I've, mm -hmm. I've really enjoyed drawing my own photos that I took mm -hmm. of him at the Queen Adam Lambert concerts. Yeah, I, so, actually, I wanted to ask you because you, you just recently attended several shows. Do you think they will inspire you to, to make some new art? I think so. But to be honest, I think the editing process is also like a bit of art because yeah, um, absolutely. I agree. at a yeah, concert yeah. venue, you always have distracting lights in the background. You have you see a lot of phones actually in the audience mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the emergency exits and the staircase lightings and a stray light beam somewhere that just sort yeah. of actually a friend recently asked me like how I choose what to edit out and what to keep and I sort of like when I see a photo I see what it could be mm -hmm. so like I look at the photo and I see like the slide is disturbing and I'll take it out and polish mm -hmm. it in a way so yeah. that's what I've been doing pretty much every day since the concert, <laughs> just yeah. because I took so many photos and I'm still going through them and I'm still finding photos where I think, oh, this is amazing. Yeah, that's that's mostly, that takes up my time these days. But I I have found a couple of photos, like I took a, some really, really nice close-ups of um, Brian and, and Adam, aesthetically pleasing photos, <laughs> they would make for good reference photos and also yeah. the quality is quite good. Oh, yeah. that's great i'm looking forward to seeing more of them <laughs> and your drawings if you ever feel up to to, to drawing this um, yeah these moments yeah yeah that's wonderful is there anything you would uh, love to achieve as a as a stereo photographer or an, as an artist like uh, or is it just you know like a um, again, you know, I, I, I can talk about myself, like I don't have any goals as a, as a stereo photographer, I just love it, yeah, I, I love, it. for me it's a great uh, entertainment uh, on, the, uh, on the one hand because I, I can go out and uh, I go out every day and uh, it's just kind of, you know, I, I, don't, I never feel bored because I always have, have it with me mm -hmm. and, uh, and also it's a, a way for me to connect to other people like yourself or like other, my, you know, other friends of mine that I met thanks to this and thanks to Brian, of course, as well. But I know, you know, we, we are all different. So, so do, do you think that you have any, any goals, you know, that you would love to reach as a photographer or as an artist? <laughs> well, as a stereo photographer like you, it's just something that I genuinely enjoy doing. And I want to capture memories um, of moments or of people or of animals like my dogs. Um, one of them is turning 13 in October so it's yeah. quite an age and I always like I enjoy if I get to take another stereo of him that I can look at in 10 years and just think oh you know he was a cool guy but also like when I'm on trips I like to take stereos to sort of retravel the places to remember where I went to but as a photographer I would actually love to make that my profession it's a hard task the same with art but like event photography or portrait photography, that would be the goal in, you know, the big goal mm -hmm, in the distance. Mm -hmm. Well, I really hope you you achieve it, and I think you have all qualities for this Thank and you. talents. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, really, really wishing you good luck with with this. Thank and you. yeah, <laughs> yeah, you do need luck to get certain opportunities. Yes, yes, That's it's, it's, a, it's it a hard. Yeah, I I, yeah. I I I know I know a number of artists. I know it's a hard hard path but it's it's worth it I think <laughs> yeah 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 it all depends on what happens in the world and my life and mm. you know like with COVID I couldn't really do much I couldn't even like I take um dog portraits or pet portraits as well and it was impossible to just meet people yes and mm -hmm. that made it quite hard um so it all depends on what happens and also it depends on where I live because my hometown is in the middle of nowhere I just need to be in the right place at the right time basically and hope mm -hmm, for the best. Mm -hmm. I hope, yes. So let's hope it all yes. it, uh, <laughs> it all comes true. So uh, one last thing that I, I again I ask everyone, uh, because we are all again, we are all the fans. Uh, yes, we are all stereo enthusiasts, but we're also the fans of Queen of uh, Dr. Brian May. Uh, what does it mean to you to be a fan? Yes, because I think it's not just uh, just you know admiring music. Mm -hmm. I think it's like something more active, yes, being like more active. And I think there is a difference between being a fan or just liking, liking music, yes. liking songs or liking, you know, whatever movies, TV series, you know, whatever 
you know piece of art you, you like so what what do you think what what does it mean to you yeah i actually i agree like there's a big difference and people people have told me you know it's just a band it's really silly to get so worked up over it mm -hmm. but it's always more behind that like there's more you can't see and there's more going on and for me um I found Queen at a sort of time in my life where I wasn't quite sure, you know, who am I, what am I doing here and how do I fit in? I don't remember what it was, but well, I listened to a lot of interviews in the beginning and some of the things Brian said just really made me realize that, you know, it's okay to, to be the way you are and um, you don't have to fit in. You can just be and you can sort of make your own niche, like you can create the space that you fit into. And um, I found that really, really helpful just to, just to sort of, like as a guidance um, to keep in mind that if other people think you're weird, that's okay. That's their opinion, but it doesn't really affect you. Um, and also the music for me is a sort of like emotional security blanket in a way. It's quite important to me because like I said, um, I travel a lot, I move around a lot. And with the music, I always have like a piece of home with me. Like wherever I go, I can always just put on my earphones, turn on the music mm -hmm. and I will feel okay. Like it will be comfortable. Mm -hmm. And in tough situations, like when I was in hospital last year for so long, I tend to get like panic attacks in hospitals quite easily. So whenever the nurses had to draw blood or put in an IV, mm -hmm. these tricky things, um, nothing helped quite as well as just letting me put on music and listen mm -hmm. to Queen and just sort of let them do their thing and allowing my brain to focus on something that's not the situation I'm in. Actually, like I have a playlist called Hospital Cheer Up just because <laughs> I put in all the songs where I knew like listening to them would put me in a good mood, a good mood. And um, yeah, like there is always more. It's never really just a band, like sometimes traveling and being in the train where it's loud and there's children screaming and people talking and you just put in your earphones and turn on the music and it's okay. Like mm -hmm. it's not as bad. And mm -hmm. even if the train is delayed, that's okay because you know, you have the music. Like, I think I trained my brain to sort of like, I conditioned it to queen equals calm. Yeah. <laughs> sort of, like there's no need to be stressed if you're listening to queen. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I so agree. I agree. Yeah. I think like for me, like the people in the band sort of helped me as a person to just sort of feel comfortable with who I am. Um, and the music helps me to cope with the world in a way. Oh yeah, it's so well said, and uh, I think it's it's very similar for me because I uh, Queen also helped me through very hard times uh, in the last three years, four years, mm -hmm. and uh, and I agree, it's like a safe safe haven for me. Like I yes. can I can you know just when I listen to this, I I feel calm and, and I feel happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and mm -hmm. like when I was moving around so much, um, rather frequently. Um, whenever I got homesick, I just put on Queen and mm -hmm. it was okay. Like, like it's really like a portable home. Yeah, it, yeah. Like, you know, the saying home is where your heart is. Yeah, yeah. And you could also say like home is where you can listen to music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a way, it's, it's like uh, they, they're like family to me, even though, you know, I haven't met yes. any of them in real life. But uh, yeah, the music does give that sort of feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah a big warm hug. I was uh, in London this this summer and attend, attended one of their concerts in O2, and I felt like I am seeing old friends, <laughs> you know, on stage because they it, also they're really good at making mm -hmm. you feel that way. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. some other bands, there's always a sort of distance, but it's not really there. Like they really build the connection with the oh, audience. Oh yes, yes, yes. And I also, think. like Brian on Instagram, he really he he really makes an effort to connect with people, and I really admire that because. Mm -hmm he interacts with a lot of people every day and he mm -hmm. still always makes an effort to be nice and I think that's like a personality trait that's really admirable yeah yeah I agree and I, I think that we can uh, when I saw him first live or in the concert at a concert at, at, the, at that point I already followed his Instagram for mm -hmm. a while it kind of all came together for me because the way he communicates with the audience uh, on mm -hmm. stage is the same way he communicates with us on Instagram I think it's, yeah yeah, it's 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 like it's like two sides of the same you know, of the same coin of the same medal. So it's like a, you know being very personal, but also being able to uh, communicate to this huge audience, and mm. so that everyone see uh, feels this connection. Yes, it's, which yes. which is amazing. You know, it's something that I I've never experienced anything like this. Yeah. So only at their concerts, I think it's uh, it's where you really feel like he's addressing you. You know, even though there are like yes. tens of thousands of people.
in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Like they're really good at that. For me, Queen and Adam Lambert was one of the first concerts I ever went to because I was 18 at the time. So it was just the time um, where you got started. Like I'm sort of at the point where I'm really grateful that I've seen so many of the shows. But I'm also at the point where I think, you know, what what other concerts can I see that can match that? <laughs> like I started with the very best and yeah. it's sort of hard to follow that. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for everything you uh, you told us. And thank you so much for this conversation. It was so interesting and so wonderful to talk to you. If you are listening to this uh, conversation of Spotify, please check out uh, Yanina's um, uh, Instagram. Yanina, so, so I like I have two accounts. Yeah. Um, my personal sort of slash photography account mm -hmm. where I post the concert photos is J A underscore L I underscore N I N A. Yes. And my art photo, uh, my art account is um, B Y underscore J A L I N I N A. Okay, um, thank you. So I will put this into the description of this uh, yeah. of this episode, so so that others can <laughs> check them out. Uh, but uh, thank you so much, and uh, it's been a real, real pleasure. And I just again, I just want to wish you good luck with your with your career as, as a photographer. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing your photos, your stereos, and your and your drawings. And I hope to see you in real life one day. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Maybe at the next tour. If yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Absolutely. Otherwise, whenever you come back to Europe. Yes. 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 <laughs> so thank you so much and have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you.